morning and welcome to the Washington Legal Foundation's web seminar series. I'm Glenn Lammy, Chief Counsel of the Foundation's Legal Studies Division. I want to thank you for joining us today. For those of you who are not familiar with the Foundation's work, we are in our 38th year of public interest law, policy, advocacy, and education. We do this work through litigation in all state and federal courts, very much so in the U.S. Supreme Court. We file about 20 briefs or so a year in the Supreme Court at the cert stage and at the merit stage as well. In addition to that, we have a very vigorous publishing program through our Legal Studies Division. Uh, we've published in eight different set length formats uh, on a wide range of issues. All of those papers are available on our website. And we also put on programs such as this one, as well as media briefings. We have a blog, the WLF Legal Pulse, that is very active uh, in publishing both our in-house attorneys and uh, guest bloggers as well. And we also engage in communications uh, programs and, and campaigns on a wide range of issues as well. A recent poll showed that 87% of those surveyed had no idea what the Internet of Things was. I'm relatively certain, however, that among those 87%, a large number of them have used an Internet of Things device, such as an ATM machine, which has been around since 1974. Such Internet-enabled devices abound today. There are, they are our smartphones, our televisions, our wearable device uh, fitness assistance devices, our kitchen appliances, and our automobiles. The rapid proliferation of these products has inspired privacy and data security concerns. Less considered, but no less serious, are the tort liability risks that accompany these technologically complex products. Our speaker today will assess how networked products could give rise to both traditional and unique failure to warn, design defect, and other product liability claims, and how businesses in the chain of supply, production, and sales can manage such risks. We'll be using a PowerPoint presentation today, which we'll be running on a screen adjacent to the viewing screen. Uh, I also send it out to everyone this morning who registered. If I missed anybody, please email me at interactive at wf.org, and I will send you the, the PowerPoint presentation during the program. That's also the email address that you can send questions to for Mr. O'Brien uh, while the program is going on, and we will address those at the end of the program. Michael O'Brien is a partner with Wilson, Elser, Moskowitz, Edelman, and Dicker in the firm's White Plains, New York office. His product liability-based practice focuses on representing U.S. and Asia-based manufacturers and distributors as national counsel in litigation, pre-suit investigations, and class actions. He also advises clients on reporting obligations to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission and counsels them on voluntary recall issues. Michael's been monitoring the Internet of Things as growing applications and uses in the marketplace and is at the forefront of predicting its potential long-term consequences for product manufacturers, software companies, and their distributors. He has written an excellent series of articles for the Wilson Elser Product Liability Advocate blog on the product liability implications of the Internet of Things and speaks frequently on the subject. Michael, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Glenn. Good morning. I'd like to thank Glenn uh, for that fine introduction and the Washington Legal Foundation for providing me this opportunity to talk about a subject that I'm extremely interested in, and it's a subject that is only recently become uh, something that um, many stakeholders in the Internet of Things industry are beginning to grapple with. Uh, and so I'd like to take some time to first explain how did I get involved in this to begin with? How did I get here today? Well, about a year ago, one of my clients, who I represent on a national basis for about the past 10 years, told me, that by 2017, 90% of their products are going to be connected to the Internet. Now, this is a client that does make products that are Internet friendly. They make smartphones, they make monitors, they make computers, they make smart TVs, but they also make washers and dryers, they make microwave ovens, they make all manner of household appliances. So I said, why do you want to be connected to the Internet with a washer and a dryer? So as I started to research this, because I wanted to be in a position to provide additional value services to the client, is I began to realize that there are some benefits to the Internet of Things. So for instance, with a washer and a dryer, you can operate those products in off-peak hours, and in the process of doing so, you derive the benefit of less energy costs, so you have a savings there. And of course, if you're environmentally conscious, that's another benefit that you gain from that. The other benefit, of course, is that if you're connected to the internet, advanced diagnostics are capable. So how many of you have had the experience where you've had a spouse or yourself 
you've had a problem with a large appliance at your home and you've had to call and get a repair person to come in. And of course, the repair person will tell you there's a window of opportunity between 10 and 11 or 10 and 1, and I'll be there then. Well, they come at 2, so you've already lost that block of time that you devoted for that uh, home repair call. And then when they show up, they say, well, we're sorry, we don't have the part. So you have to make another scheduled visit. Well, the Internet of Things will provide some of the opportunities with the advanced diagnostics to either reboot and fix the product without having the need for a service call, or it will allow them to do the diagnostics and have the service tech come out with the part that's needed in order to fix the product. So those are some of the benefits that, that are available with the Internet of Things. Now, Glenn, I think the slide presentation that I gave you may have some slides that I don't have in front of me today. Is my first slide IoT is not Y2K? Yes. Okay. So that was a slide that I've added just recently because back in the late 1990s, uh, people were focused on Y2K and the possibility that all of our computers would become inoperable as soon as we went from 1999 to 2000. And as a lawyer during that time period, I wasn't involved directly with these, these concerns other than being made aware of them and knowing that there were a lot of individuals, insurance companies, and various stakeholders concentrating on this. Well, it became a big to-do about nothing. Nothing happened. Everything went on as normal. So as a result, I want to emphasize IoT is not Y2K. This is real, it's happening, and it's going to get even more challenging as we move into the exponential growth that IoT is going to take place. One of the questions I ask the audiences that I speak to is, what do you know about IoT? What is the Internet of Things? Show me by a raise of hands uh, how many of you know what the Internet of Things is. And as Glenn alluded to in his opening comments is that by far less than 20 or 25 percent of those who are attending a program about the Internet of Things understand or even know what the Internet of Things is. Next slide, please. So what is the Internet of Things? It's the third wave of the Internet. The first wave was in the 1990s when the infrastructure was being built. The second wave was in the 2000s with the dual development of Internet services as well as mobile connectivity. Next slide, please. But how does the IoT operate? Well, the IoT operates on embedded sensors that are in the products or they're in the environment. They collect data, and that information is then sent to data stores. Think cloud computing. The data stores, in turn, interact with analytic engines to provide feedback and, in turn, control the sensors. So now we're starting to see where smart thinking is taking place. Next slide, please. So next slide. Are we on sensors give objects? Okay. So the sensors give objects the power of perception into conditions such as temperature, voltage, motion, chemistry, and usage. Next slide, please. So sensor-driven computing, i.e. the analytics, convert these perceptions into insights that operators and systems can act on. So for those of you who are attending today's program and you say, I don't know what the IoT is, you actually do. You just don't realize what products uh, IoT uh, involves. So we already have smart cars and trucks. We have smart TVs, cell phones. We have home security and HVAC systems that you can program and operate from remote locations if you're out of the home, you're on vacation, for instance. There's industrial manufacturing, which is a big, big sector, sector of the Internet of Things. Medical devices. And then two areas that people think are standalone uh, areas of new technology and development, such so as drones and 3D manufacturing, but those are also Internet of Things. And part of that is because the software that drives some of these new um, technological innovations, such as drones and 3D manufacturing, are open source code. And that allows these programs to be developed uh, via the Internet. So how big is the IoT? Well, as I told you, one of my clients is a consumer electronics um, home appliance manufacturer. And they regularly attend the consumer electronics show in Las Vegas. And this past year, over 900 exhibitors 
of IoT technologies for home, cars, and security systems and appliances had exhibits. Next slide, please. How big will IoT become? According to Gartner, there are over 5 billion devices connected to the Internet today. So think about that. That means right now there are more Internet-connected devices on this planet than there are people. And it's the exponential growth, not the linear growth, that's driving the Internet of Things. By 2020, there will be 25 billion devices connected to the Internet, with revenues exceeding 300 billion. Now think about that, with 25 billion devices connected to the Internet, that means that every man, woman, and child on the planet will have on average about five or six devices connected to the Internet. Next slide, please. One of the first areas that I started conducting my research is I looked at a report by Goldman Sachs that was published in September 2014. And for those of you who are following the PowerPoints, you'll see in several of the slides that are on display today at the bottom in yellow highlight, that will be the primary source of the material that I am using today for my presentation. So that if you're interested in, in reading more in depth from these sources, the PowerPoints will give you access to um, the actual primary source. So the September 2014 Goldman Sachs report identified the key sectors that were driving the market. There's wearables. Okay, I'm wearing one of them today. I'm wearing a Nike bracelet that tracks the calories that I burn. It measures the steps that I take each day. I have a programmable goal for the amount of energy I want to consume and use. And then when I need to recharge the battery on this, I plug it into an adapter on my computer and that information is downloaded onto the computer, and it's stored and saved. And, of course, Nike, as the uh, manufacturer of the device, is collecting and using that data. And it's collecting and using that data from every user of one of these devices, just like every other Internet-connected product uh, device manufacturer or distributor is doing. Connected cars is another area of growth. We've all heard stories about autonomous vehicles on the horizon. We know Google, for instance, has developed an autonomous vehicle. 60 Minutes has done a, a presentation on uh, the development of Google's autonomous vehicle. Uh, some forecasters say we're less than five years away from where autonomous vehicles will be common vehicles uh, in operation. Uh, connected homes, we already have connected homes. I've given examples of HVAC systems connected to the internet, uh, security systems. Uh, smart TVs and so on, all in your home. Connected cities, the industrial internet, which will include transportation, oil and gas, and healthcare, are all sectors that were identified by Goldman Sachs. Next slide, please. This next slide is just a, a slide that I took from the report by Goldman Sachs, and it just identifies the sectors. It's a little bit more of a visual idea of how big, how broad, and pervasive the IoT landscape will be and is. Next slide, please. So what were the driving forces of the market? Well, Goldman Sachs has identified cheap sensors, cheap bandwidth, cheap processing, smartphones, ubiquitous, wireless coverage, and big data, all key components driving the force of the Internet of Things. The other forces include the value proposition of new product cycles, cost efficiencies, productivity, and cost savings. We'll get into those in a little more detail as I move through this program. New apps and software platforms are also driving the Internet of Things. The industrial Internet of Things is one of the major sectors identified by Goldman Sachs. Well, in 2014, the Industrial Internet Consortium was formed. The founding members include AT&T, Cisco, GE, IBM, and Intel. Today, there are 200 member companies, and let me update you on that. On Tuesday of this week, I attended the first security conference held by the Industrial Internet Consortium at IBM's New York City headquarters. And at that time, they reported there are now 211 members of the Industrial Internet Consortium in 26 different countries. And I'll, if I have time, I'll share some additional information that I gleaned from attending that conference. So the Industrial Internet of Things describes the integration of complex physical machinery and devices with network sensors and software used to predict, control, and plan better business and social outcomes. Blah, 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 blah. That sounds all nice and good, but what does it really mean? Well, what does it mean is that we're going to have 
machine-to-machine, M2M applications have been developed. And what are they being used for? It's for advanced scheduled and preventive maintenance and to anticipate critical failures. So for instance, at the conference that I attended earlier this week, an example was given. Airbus is using these advanced tools that the Internet of Things provides in order to be able to service engines before a critical failure takes place that will take them out of service for a longer period of time. That's a benefit of keeping the fleet in use, keeping the fleet going and not having a long delay period when the fleet or a plane has to be taken out of service. One of the other benefits that I didn't realize about this was that there is at the back end of the life of the plane a value proposition added to that. When you resell the plane during the course of its useful life, you can generate 20 to 25 percent additional return on the original investment because you have used the Internet of Things for the advanced diagnostics, the preventive maintenance, and anticipation of critical failures. GE, who is, is one of the members of the industrial internet, has, next slide please, has indicated that 10 to 15 trillion to global GDP over the next 20 years will take place. GE is transforming itself. I represent GE in the appliance business because some of my clients make products for GE, okay? And so I've gotten to know GE a little bit, but GE is transforming itself. They sold their appliance division, okay? down in Louisville, Kentucky to Electrolux. They are now becoming more focused on being a industrial Internet of Things company. They sold GE Capital. Electric Insurance Company may be the next to go because of this reformation of General Electric. It's also the development of the Internet of Things is going to have significant changes in the landscape of technology. Gardner has estimated that one in three knowledge workers will be replaced in 2020, by 2020. McKinsey Global Institute estimates uh, an annual economic impact of 2.7 trillion to 6.5 trillion by 2025. When I was talking with Glenn earlier today, I had read yesterday that it was Verizon, I believe, that said they've generated 500 million in revenues this year alone from the Internet of Things. Next slide, please. But at what cost is this wonderful advancement in technology that has the possibilities of benefiting industries, businesses, individuals going to be? Well, Hewlett Packard in 2014 found that 70% of commonly used IoT devices contain security vulnerability. And from attending programs where security professionals have lectured on security and software, it's a given. Software always has vulnerabilities. There's no way to develop software and applications of software that will be used in the Internet that are going to not contain vulnerabilities. And those vulnerabilities become the weak points, the access points for hackers and um, malicious uh, individuals who want to take advantage of these vulnerabilities. So there's a constant ongoing battle to improve security by software patches, updates, and, and new types of technology. Next slide, please. So what's the hypothetical threat? All right, so we have a smart refrigerator that communicates with the store to set up delivery of groceries. Now, at the conference I was at a Tuesday, an example was given that you're on vacation, your smart refrigerator communicates with the store, tells the store what you need, you drive your car to the store on your way home from your vacation and everything that the refrigerator ordered for you is waiting for you. You don't even have to go into the store. It's brought out to your car and loaded into your car. And maybe it's going to be an autonomous vehicle. So you're sitting in the back, you know, with your handheld uh, downloading a movie or something and then you go home. But what are the potential threats? Well, the obvious one is that the purchase patterns are being monitored. That's one of the things that you're going to be giving up with IoT connected devices. The companies that sell you these devices do want your information because that information is valuable and that information is going to be sold to third parties. And some people say, well, I'm not going to buy an IoT product. Well, IoT products are going to become the default. They're too cheap not to have them as the default. So basically, it's not going to be in five years you walk into a Best Buy and you say, I want a refrigerator, but I don't want the upgrade to the IoT. They're all going to be connected to the IoT. 
And then it's a question of what use do you put that to in the use of your refrigerator, your washer, your dryer, whatever is used in your home. But having your product connected to the Internet of Things presents you with privacy and security threats to your personal data, which can be collected and sold, or it could become an entry point for a hacker. Next slide, please. It also can become an entry point for hackers to access the store's payment database. And in fact, this is exactly how the large-scale hack against Target last year was achieved. It was through a third-party HVAC vendor whose software security was the weak link allowing for access to Target's customer base. Well, have there actually been some, next slide please, have there actually been IoT failures? Well, Wink's wireless hub connected to uh, various devices in the home via an app that you could carry on your handheld devices uh, had a glitch in April of this year that disabled the connected devices. Now think if your garage doors uh, were connected to that app and uh, there was a glitch and the garage doors were open and your house was now vulnerable to an intruder. Or think of your HVAC system and it's you're down in uh, Florida on vacation and it's a cold day up here in the Northeast and um, all of a sudden the HVA system goes down to um, you know, 40 degrees and it's sub-freezing temperatures outside, your water pipes freeze and bust. Those are some of the concerns that people have with the ability of these devices to be controlled from remote locations and if there are glitches in the software, which is one thing, or they're vulnerable to hackings, which is an entirely second different thing, there's areas for mischief or damage to take place. One of the more serious ones was Hospera's infusion, uh, insulin infusion pump uh, was identified by the Federal Food Drug Administration that issued warnings to hospital that it was vulnerable to hacking and dosing of critical patient therapies. Now, I was talking to Glenn earlier today, you know, some of this stuff is actually working its way into um, uh, popular television series. Um, CBS, CSI Cyber is a popular TV show that comes from the original CSI programming, they've already had two programs where IOT has been used to create um, property damage or commit murders. One of them was uh, common household appliances were being used to start fires from a hacker at a remote location, and he was trying to extort a company. That episode was in March of this year. Uh, and more recently, I saw a, uh, a little blurb on the internet where uh, another story was being used in which a critical dosage of morphine was uh, administered to a patient in a hospital that resulted in the patient's death, and that was done by a malicious person who was trying to uh, take advantage of some particular situation. I haven't seen the episode, but you can see that it's working its way into uh, television, and it's already worked its way into movies. So what are some of the examples of actual IoT hacks that have led to property damage? The Stunex cyber attack, next slide please, um, was on an Iranian nuclear facility in September 2010 uh, that resulted in the damaging of the centrifuge's operational capacity. These attacks are commonly thought to have occurred either by the um, Mossad, which is the Israel Israeli intelligence um, agency, or NSA, or in combination of both. And what they did is that a flash drive was used to administer a worm into the computer system at the facility. That worm was looking for specific information relating to the centrifuges which were manufactured by the German industrial company Siemens. And they lie in wait until they found access to the machines and then what they did is that they either sped up the centrifuges or they slowed down the centrifuges, all the while masking what was taking place and sending data to the people in the facility that were monitoring the performance of the centrifuges that everything was okay, no problems. Everything's running as you expect it to. If the centrifuges run too fast, it did damages to the centrifuges. If it ran too slow, the quality of the uranium was not weapons grade and therefore the objectives of the Iranian government were being frustrated by this first example of an internet-based hack. On October 15th of this year, NOVA, uh, which is a program on PBS, uh, broadcast a one-hour episode that went into great detail on how this whole attack was perpetrated 
and it focused on the story of two security analysts who were able to figure out the manner and method in which this entire episode took place. More recently, uh, at the end of, of um, this past year, a German steel foundry was attacked uh, by a hacker who gained access to the controls to a blast furnace and allowed the blast furnace to run out of control and did self-damage to the blast furnace. The German government investigated this and issued a report on this. Glenn, if you could take us up to the slide, it says IoT is a threat to national security, emergency preparedness. So what's the federal government doing about this? Well, in November 2014, the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee issued a report to the President on the Internet of Things. They had been studying this for a while. They had indicated that back in 2008, the U.S. National Intelligence Council had warned that IoT could be disruptive technology by 2025, 10 years from now. However, as of last year, the Council indicated that the disruptive nature of the IoT is going to occur far sooner than 2025 if it's not already taking place. Next slide, please. The NSTAC found that the compromise or malfunction of IoT devices could have national security and emergency preparedness implications. So think of compromises devices connected to different critical infrastructure systems, like a water treatment plant, and the potential for major economic disruption, kinetic damage impacting on public safety. Think about the energy grid getting knocked out by an IoT attack. In extreme cases, catastrophic failure of national infrastructure or critical systems could occur. So what were some of the more compelling, next slide please, provoking and uh, thought-provoking findings reached by the committee? Well, the lines between consumer and industrial devices continue to blur, with consumer devices used intentionally or not in ways that affect national security and emergency preparedness. The strong growth in interconnected, potentially adaptive devices implies a larger cybersecurity attack surface with potentially cascading adverse effects, both the cyber and physical domains. And this is all because of the exponential growth in connected devices. Um, next slide, please. Among, again, the more compelling observations and findings by the committee, uh, IOT represents a convergence or perhaps a collision of IT and OT. And this is an important point. This was emphasized on Tuesday when I was at the security conference for the Industrial Internet Consortium. IT is the uh, information technology that we're all familiar with in businesses where every day we have tech people who are monitoring our computer systems, updating software, making sure that we are putting up barriers to prevent us from being attacked by malicious software. OT is operational technology, and OT has its applications in the industrial world, where you have machines operating 24-7. And therefore, they're not and haven't been traditionally as concerned with security as they have been with making sure that operationally the machines are doing what they're supposed to be doing in an efficient manner and being maintained so that there's no breakdowns or interruptions. But when you have M2M, machine to machine communications now, where information is being exchanged and it's being connected to the internet and that information is being used in other types of applications by businesses, you're creating a new vulnerability in a portal for these hacks to take place or vulnerabilities to manifest themselves. And so as a result, you're, you're finding that you're marrying old technology with new technology because many of these machines that operate 24-7 are very expensive capital investments. And these machines may be using technology that by today's standards is considered ancient, but it may only be 10 years old. But these machines ha may have a 20, 25, 30-year lifespan. So what is the challenge when these d machines start to communicate on the internet, start collecting data, start using sensors to perform functions, advance maintenance, all that type of stuff. That's one of the friction points that those who are members of the Industrial Internet of Things Consortium are concerned about. Next slide, please. So, and again, one of the other concerns is that innovation and Adaptation of the Internet of Things technology is outpacing the development of IoT governance. 
There are no standards right now. The products that I represent for my client when a product liability lawsuit is brought or a claim is brought are all governed by safety standards. Underwriters Laboratories, Canadian Standards Association, ANSI, these are all standards that are widely adopted and accepted. And if you want to sell your product in the U.S. market, almost to the very end, certainly with consumer products, you have to comply with one of these safety standards or you're not going to be able to sell your product. Vendors won't purchase it. They want that threshold level of safety. But when you start adding software to a traditional product, such as um, a um, microwave oven or washer and dryer, the standards organizations haven't yet adapted to that. And there aren't standards that exist for IoT in general. They're being developed, but they're at the very early stages. Meanwhile, technology is going down the highway like a Maserati at 125 miles an hour while the standards and government oversight is trying to play catch up. Next slide, please. So we already discussed one area where the federal government has identified a threat. In February or January of this year, Federal Trade Commission issued a report on some of the safety and security concerns with the IoT. And again, if you look at the bottom of the slide, uh, Internet of Things, Privacy and Security in a Connected World, the FTC staff report, January 2015. That will take you to that report, and you'll be able to read it in whole if you're interested. They gave examples, of course, of insulin pumps being accessed remotely and doses that just changed, and remote access to starting a car or disabling the safety devices. This report is old by today's standards because we now know that cars have been hacked. Okay, At the time this, this report was issued, the FTC indicated that the hacker had to have physical contact with the car in order to achieve the objective of hacking it and disabling the critical safety devices. We know from Wired Magazine's report in uh, July 2015 this year, which I'll discuss in more detail uh, later on, is that you do not need physical access to the vehicle anymore, that the hacking can take place remotely, and that therefore you can criti compromise critical safety devices within an automobile. In uh, 2013, former U.S. President Dick Cheney revealed that he disconnected his defibrillator and heart pump from the Internet to prevent its hacking at the uh, recommendation of his doctor. So as far back as 2013, this was a concern um, with uh, individuals who are using uh, safety devices, um, medical devices that are connected to the Internet. So in February of this year, next, threat, uh, next uh, slide please, Senator Edward Markey, Democrat from Massachusetts, issued a report addressing IoT concerns with automobiles. What he did is he sent out a survey questionnaire to all the major automobile manufacturers asking them a multitude of questions about what types of security measures are you taking to pre prevent your uh, motor vehicles from being hacked? Uh, have there been instances where the vehicles have been hacked? And the responses by the automobile manufacturers were very, very wide and diverse. And according to the Senator Markey um, left a lot to be desired in terms of uh, his concerns about uh, vehicles being safe from uh, outside hacking influences. He uh, did a presentation on 60 Minutes about this the day before the report was issued. The report, Tracking and Hacking, Security and Privacy Gaps Put American Drivers at Risk, uh, can be downloaded off the internet and a greater, more detailed discussion about that will take place. In April of this year, the Government Accounting Office uh, issued a report, Air Traffic Control, FAA needs a more comprehensive approach to address cybersecurity as agency transitions to next gen, in which they identified modern aircraft are increasingly connected to the internet. This interconnectedness can potentially provide unauthorized remote access to aircraft avionics systems. Uh, the FAA has taken steps to protect the air traffic control systems from cyber-based threats. However, significant security control weaknesses remain. Well, this is the next portion of this slide is a chilling um, example of concerns that people have. Chris Roberts of One World Labs claims that he was able to hack and seize control of a commercial aircraft in 2015. He said he was able to do this through the entertainment system on the aircraft 
in the cabin. And he actually claims that he was able to take control of one of the jet engines on the aircraft. The FBI is investigating this. Now, there's nothing new out there about this that I've been able to ascertain, but it does give cause for concern about the vulnerability of aircraft, again, because modern aircraft, like many, many industrial applications, are a marriage of old technology and new technology. And that creates the portals in which these sophisticated attacks can take place. Next slide, please. Just this past month, uh, September 10th, the FBI posted an online public service announcement warning the public of IoT risks for cybercrime. The important thing about this from my standpoint is they emphasize that a compromised IoT device could cause physical harm. Up to now, everybody has been concerned about cybersecurity more as the theft of intangible property. That's where the insurance industry has been largely focused. That's where a lot of the financial institutions have largely been concerned. The healthcare institutions, it's the, the harvesting of personal data and selling that uh, that has been the concern. Now we're entering a new realm where not only is there the threat of physical damage to property, there's the threat of physical harm to individuals. And what was identified as one of the most vulnerable devices? The universal plug and play protocol as being especially vulnerable to exploitation. The insurance industry is looking at this. Next slide, please. In May of this year, Swiss Re uh, issued its new emerging risks insights, and they identified four things as having the very highest impact within the next five years. Now, IoT was one of them. The other three were deglobalization, the great monetary experiment, and the supernatural category storms. Now think about that. If IoT falls into those categories, we're talking about billions and trillions of dollars of vulnerability. We're not talking about something that's going to creep up on us. Swiss Re has identified this as a major source of potential risk in the next five years. AIG, next slide please, issued a white paper and it's the first of what appears to be several that they plan to publish. And they've identified some of the concerns with cyber breaches, uh, shifting questions of property and products liability. Businesses can't afford to enter this new technology unprepared. Um, one of the things that they focus upon without coming out and saying is the ethics of IoT connected devices. If you have an autonomous vehicle, as an example, and you're a passenger in an autonomous vehicle, and the vehicle is taking you to your destination down the highway, and it comes up to a construction site where traffic is being blocked, and it has to make a quick decision. Does it stop? Does it veer off in order to avoid collision with the construction site? But in the process of doing that, does it then hit a pedestrian and injure a pedestrian? Now, we will be relying on software programs to make these decisions. Are all of these decisions going to be decisions that are in the best inter interest of everyone? If it's a driver driving a motor vehicle, those kinds of decisions are recognized as human nature. You have to react in a split second. But if you have a software program making, making those decisions, what kind of programming is the software application? And that's going to be some of the ethical challenges that are going to have to be addressed with the IoT. Next slide, please. So privacy and data, just like cybersecurity in the traditional sense that I've made reference to, <clears throat> exists with the IoT. AT&T this month, actually last month, I'm getting a little behind myself or ahead of myself, but in any event, AT&T issued a report saying that it observed a 458% increase in the Internet of Things vulnerability scans against IoT devices. It also acknowledges, like Gartner did, that 50 billion things will be sharing data by 2020. Small sensors can be harder to secure than bigger, more sophisticated devices. And the bottom line is, and this is one of the things that I'm concerned about myself, is that smaller, less complex devices may be more potential security gaps to man manage because the investment's not going to be made. The throwaway device, I've given the example of my you know, Nike band. 
150 bucks. Okay, what's the useful life of that? What if there's a vulnerability with this? Five years from now, if I'm still wearing this, am I going to get a software update? Microsoft has stopped sending out updates to, you know, I think Windows XP and Windows 7. So there are going to be issues about the lifespan of a product still connected to the Internet and whether or not uh, companies are going to be able to continue to service the product and protect it against um, potential hazards that could exist, whether it's just a malfunction or it's because some malicious actor is trying to accomplish some uh, criminal activity. So what are the litigation risks? Next slide, please. Well, one of them is a small glitch with a product impacting on hundreds of thousands of millions of devices is an ideal recipe for a product liability, no injury class action. And we have examples of that. Uh, within weeks after Senator Markey uh, had issued his report on the vulnerability of um, US uh, motor vehicles to outside hacking forces, a class action lawsuit was filed against Toyota, uh, General Motors, and Ford in the US District Court for Cal Northern District of California. And what were the theories of liability? Breach of warranty, as the vehicles were not free of defects because the defendants failed to ensure basic electronic security of their vehicles. As a result, anyone can hack into them, take control of the basic functions of the vehicle, and thereby endanger the safety of the driver and others. Next slide, please. So they identified that most vehicles have 35 separate electronic control units, and they are function under a controlled area network. The control area network is the old technology dating back to the 1980s. And the marriage of the new technology with the old technology is where the vulnerabilities exist. Vehicle functionality and safety depend on the functions of these small computers, the most essential of which is how they communicate with one another. The hacker could take control of such basic functions of the vehicle as braking, steering, acceleration, and the driver of the vehicle would not be able to regain control. At the time that this class action was brought, this was all a hypothetical threat. We now know it's no longer hypothetical. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, Wired Magazine in July 2015 reported on a remote hack of a Chrysler Jeep where the critical safety systems were taken control of remotely. Within days of the publication of this report, Chrysler Fiat recalled 1.4 million of the affected vehicles and the immediate aftermath of that, yet another class action was brought against Fiat Chrysler in the US District Court for the Southern District of Illinois. In this particular thing, next slide please, this particular lawsuit, um, Harman International, the manufacturer of the infotainment system called Uconnect was the weak point vulnerability uh, for access to the vehicles. And the recall announced by Fiat Chrysler, according to the class action pleadings, didn't fix the entire problem. Um, the essential problem is that they are non-secured systems are coupled with essential engine and safety controls, which is not a software problem. The software updates are only a remedial fix for known vulnerability, vulnerabilities. So again, breach of warranty, fraud, negligence, unjust enrichment, state consumer fraud, and business practices violations, which are all the uh, normal recipe of product liability, no injury, class action litigations uh, were developed. Both of these lawsuits, as I understand, are still pending, although the one in California, there's a motion to dismiss pending, uh, but as of today, I'm not aware of any decision uh, being rendered on that. And of course, in these class action litigations, the, 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 the plaintiff's attorney wants to survive that initial attempt to dismiss the class actions. If they can survive that, even if parts of the class of the complaint are stricken, they can advance through discovery and get to a point where they may be able to ransom the settlement that they're looking for, which to most consumers will be a $30 coupon and the lawyers will get $30 million. That's the recipe we live in uh, in this environment today. So the next slide deals with government intervention. Um, the Spy Car Act of 2015, this was introduced by uh, Senator Markey of Massachusetts and Connecticut Sen Senator Blumenthal. And um, part of it is to prevent the data from being used um, against the wishes of the drivers and also to provide a cyber dashboard which will inform the consumers of the extent of which the motor vehicle protects uh, for cybersecurity and privacy of the owners, lessees, drivers, and passengers. Next slide, please. One of the important aspects of the Spy Car Act 2015 is that 
owners and lessees will be given the option of terminating the collection and retention of driving data with two exceptions, and those are going to be essential safety features for the motor vehicles. But this, I think, may be uh, what we see in the future with a lot of IoT uh, devices. If you have to accept the product as being IoT connected, you may have the ability to have an opt-out provision so that if you don't want your personal data collected from the product, uh, you may be able to do so, but you'll still have a product that is connected to the Internet. Next slide, please. So after scaring everybody, or at least hopefully raising a few concerns with people as to what this is all about, what are some of the emerging product liability considerations? Well, the obvious one is, you know, you're going to have the potential for product liability defects that are brought about by the software, the sensors, the chips that are now being made part and parcel of what traditionally have been products that did not use these types of devices or components, if you will. So that's, that's a layer of complexity that will be added to, to the traditional area of product liability exposure where it's a design or manufacturing defect that we have to be concerned with. Now, when I get involved in a lot of the investigations with my clients, it may be because there's a fire and their product is in what they call the area of origin of the fire as determined by the public sector investigators or perhaps by private investigators retained by insurance companies who are looking for a target for subrogation recovery. Traditionally, we'll send a cause and origin expert to a fire scene. If it's an electronic or electric product, we might send an electrical engineer, or we may wait and have the evidence harvested, brought back to a lab, and at that point in time, you bring in the electric engineer, the electrical engineer rather, and they'll do a forensic examination and try to do what we call a post-mortem on the evidence in order to determine did our product play any role in bringing about the sequence that led to the fire, or is it a victim of the fire? So take that as a given, but now with internet connectivity and sensors and chips being part and parcel of the traditional products we all have been become familiar with in our homes, uh, we're going to have to think about bringing new experts into play. Okay, software engineers at the forefront of the investigation, not as an afterthought. And that's going to add a layer of complexity to the traditional area of our uh, product liability investigation. Next slide, please. But of course, now, if you have these internet-connected devices and these devices are now vulnerable to hacking, what happens when one of these devices fails, causes property damage or bodily injury as a result of a hacking? Will you even know that? That's one of the dilemmas that the IoT world is going to have to grapple with. Because is it always going to be clear that a hack led to the device failing? The example I gave earlier of the German steel foundry having a blast furnace hack uh, and going out of control and then doing damage to that. Well, what happens if you're on vacation, somebody hacks your HVAC system lowers the temperature in the furnace, the pipes freeze, and you have water damage. You tell, tell your insurance company when you get back, will they know when they send out an investigator that it was done from a malicious purpose? That's one of the dilemmas that we're going to have to explore as we get into this world deeper and deeper. Next slide, please. There's also the concern where hacking occurs and it's going to result in stolen data. There is a big market for personal data. So if you have five or six IoT connected devices in your home and the weak link allows outside hackers to collect personal data, that information, just like the traditional cybersecurity uh, thefts of intangible property, is something that can take place. And many times th there have been security experts who have said this type of hacking, you won't even know it's occurring because it's going to be running in the background and you may not become aware of it or become aware that that's the vulnerability point. You'll just have your identity uh, stolen and you'll find that you've got charges on credit cards that you didn't have and you won't know that it came as a result of your own IoT devices. Next slide, please. So what are some of the emerging product liability considerations? As I mentioned, we may need new types of experts, software engineers, cybersecurity specialists. There are no standards currently governing, governing IoT products. Here's another thing, insurance implications, gaps in coverages. 
The cyber policies traditionally don't cover property damage and bodily injury. They are first and third party coverages that protect against the loss of intangible property. So what will happen? Parties will have to look to their CGL, Comprehensive General Liability, their Product Liability, their E&O, which is Errors and Emission, and D&O, which may, Directors and Officers, which may cover some but not all of these losses. And so there may be gaps. And then from the insurance company perspective, if you do have to cover for one of these losses, you've got to say to yourself, am I getting adequate premium for the risk that I'm now facing because my customer, my insured, is selling hundreds of thousands or millions of IoT-connected devices? Did I take that into account when I had the underwriters quote the premium for this? So what's going to happen in the short term is difference in conditions policies are being developed. I, AIG has one called Edge Pro. I think Chubb Ace is developing one as well. But then I think you're going to see that the insurance industry may start initially reacting by saying, well, wait a second, if we start to see these things going on, we're going to have to maybe have exclusions because we don't know how big this problem is going to be. And maybe they're going to wait on the sidelines and see a few other carriers take on the risk and try to track it. Reinsurance is going to play a big, big role in this because reinsurance is going to stand behind a lot of the primary carriers that are going to write this business or, or get unintentionally write the business because they didn't think that they had a risk in this area, but then they find that their policy does provide the coverage and it's an enormous loss. Next slide, please. Well, we're in Washington, so one of the next considerations is there's all the alphabet agencies that are overseeing the various sectors of the industries that are embracing the IoT. So there are reporting obligations to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, the National Highway Safety Traffic Administra Administration, and the FTC. Who's going to take responsibility for reporting? Is it going to be the manufacturer? If the software company, if it's not a proprietary company, it's providing it to the manufacturer as a third party vendor, does it have an obligation if it uncovers a glitch or a vulnerability in its software to report to the appropriate federal agency and undertake a corrective action, undertake a recall? The example we have of um, Fiat Chrysler, you know, Harman International had the software vulnerability with its infotainment system. Now, if 1.4 million vehicles were recalled and it cost $100 to fix each vehicle, that's $140 million. There's also the threat of fines for late reporting. There's the brand disparagement that takes place when an event like this occurs. So there's all types of financial consequences that can take place as a result of an IoT uh, defect um, manifesting itself with a product and again who is going to take responsibility for taking the lead who's going to bear the financial responsibility for the consequences so again what's going to be the remedy and at what cost so next slide please here's here's an area that I think is, is fascinating and that is um, who's going to be responsible for the loss does the consumer bear any responsibility. So for instance, we've used the HVA system as an example on a couple of occasions. Let's say the consumer operates all of these internet connected devices off their handheld device, but they also download a lot of crappy software that has malware on it. They forget to update the software patches that are being provided to them by the manufacturer. And as a consequence, that becomes the weak point of allowing the hack to take place that leads to the damage to the house or the building or whatever, the business. So I want to look at that handheld. I want to download the information. I want to see if the consumer bears any responsibility. Well, we all know what Tom Brady did in Deflategate when the NFL was investigating whether or not he was responsible in any way for the balls in the championship game against the Colts uh, from being underinflated. They wanted to get access to his handheld. And uh, he said, well, I've gotten rid of it. And so that's going to be an issue, that there's going to be some friction between the consumer's right to privacy, the issues re relating to security, and a potentially responsible third party, i.e. a manufacturer, wanting to defend itself, wanting to find out if 
The problem really was borne out because a consumer failed to do reasonable measures to ensure that they had adequate security. So this will bring about questions as who has the responsibility to update the software and prevent malware? Is it up to the individual, the business, stakeholders, or both? I'd say both. Next, who has custody, ownership, and control of the data? That's going to be another issue. Terms of service agreements now, nobody reads them, okay? And those terms of service agreements generally allow whatever app you're downloading, whatever uh, site you're visiting to get access to it, they own the data. You give it up to them, and then big data is big money. So that data is being amalgamated, used, and harvested, and sold. Next slide, please. Some of the other security issues, I know we're running short on time, and we may want to get a couple of questions in. So we need to manage the security throughout the life cycle of a device. You have a device that has a short lifespan. Maybe security is not such a problem. But if you have a device that lasts a long time, that becomes another problem. You have to secure the supply chain, chip, software, network. Each connection point is, it has a potential vulnerability. There's cost concerns. Cheaper IoT connected products may be less secure but more popular. Whereas the more secure, more expensive products, well, they're not going to be as popular. So maybe they're not going to be the target threat. There's security, next slide please, security and product differentiations. Cars are expensive, stoves are expensive. Coffee makers, toasters, and wearables, not so expensive. So those devices are all going to have different levels of security and different levels of security threats. What happens if the product is out of warranty? What happens if the product line is discontinued? You know, we mentioned already, Microsoft is not providing patches to uh, Windows XP or, or Windows 7. Next slide, please. So the thought I'd like to leave you with is that with the Internet of Things and all the multiple platforms of interconnected devices, the security of all the devices may well be established by the weakest link in the chain of interconnected devices. Next slide, please. So supply chain considerations. There's going to be a lot of internet startup companies that are going to be big into this. So what type of language is going to be needed in the agreements, the supplier agreements, to address risk shifting and allocation? OK, this is, goes through the entire chain of the supply chain. Next slide, please. So in my world, traditional types of things are contractual. You have hold harmless and indemnification provisions. You have documentation of adequate insurance coverage with additional insured endorsements and provisions will be required to ensure that it's the right kind of insurance for these losses. Again, there's going to be who has responsibility to report to the safety agencies. Okay, what incidents will require corrective action to be implemented? Can it be fixed by a patch like Fiat Chrysler has attempted to do with the Jeep or is it going to require something else? What happens if an IoT failure is based on a terrorist act. What happens if the Malaysian air jet that went down, that was a cyber attack as opposed to just a malfunction or the pilot doing something? The Russian jet that went down in Egypt is now beginning to look like it was a terrorist attack, but how was that brought about? How was it manifested? Next slide, please. So this is just a quick slide on some of the developing standards, some of the standard organizations that are working to develop standards. Next slide, please. Uh, the online, online Trust Alliance is developing the IoT Trust Framework. There is, you know, the, the IoT companies want to have the ability to grow, so they want to self-regulate so that they have the ability to grow, and they want to take effective actions because the concern is if something bad happens, then the government comes in and the government becomes ham-handed and they stifle innovation, they stifle growth and development. So there has to be a balance between some government oversight and some self-regulation within the interested industry groups. Insurance in the IoT, next slide please. Um, this information comes largely from a report last month from Accenture talking about some of the big changes that are going to occur in the insurance industry as a result of IoT and I think because we're running short of time I'd like to simply go through to the end and see if we have any questions that I can address and just indicate to anyone who is on the WebEx today, uh, if they're interested in contacting me, I've got uh, several articles that I've written. I'll be happy to share that information with you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you, Michael. Michael again, uh, uh, if you have questions, questions it's, it's interactive, interactive at wlf.org. WLF um, I will start questions and, and see if we'll get some from the online people. So with, in the product liability context, you're gonna, a lot of these situations that you've described are going to be initiated by, by a, a, a third, sort of third-party tort fees or an intentional tort of, of sorts by hacking. How does that figure into the product liability argument sort of scheme? Well, I, I, if you can establish that, um, you know, a, a third party was responsible, um, you know, there may be a negation of insurance coverage. It could be a negation of liability. But then even if there is a vulnerability and it's brought about by a hacker, it then raises the question that, well, did you allow that to happen? Because it's foreseeable. Anything connected to the Internet is vulnerable to hacking. And so the question, the drill down, will start being, did you as the manufacturer or the software company take adequate steps to protect against these vulnerabilities? And if in the course of uh, conducting pretrial discovery, the answer to the question is, is that no, then you may have a recipe that will lead to a finding of liability. And again, this is not traditional. This is an area that we have not traditionally seen. My initial focus is on it's a traditional defect. It's a design defect or it's a manufacturing defect and it results in a loss. We know that's going to happen. We know that's going to add a layer of complexity. But when you fold into it the potential of a hacker, we're kind of in uncharted waters because this has not been happening in the past. Would some of these claims in this sort of failure to warn context be as simple as you didn't provide a warning that these kinds of devices should be hacked or would the failure to warn claim sort of go beyond that? Well, you know, manufacturers are, are going to make reasonable attempts to warn. But then there's the question of how is the warning delivered? You know, an effective warning is only as good as if it's read, understood, and heeded. Okay? And is it, is it buried in a terms of service agreement that's 65 pages long and it's in the fine print somewhere, sort of like a kind of, you know, limited warranty type of thing? Or is it out front. And with, with the Internet of Things, I mean, people don't get uh, manuals anymore in a traditional sense. They don't get them um, in a uh, folder. You know, you can download instruction manuals off the Internet. But how many people actually read that stuff? So then the question is, do you have to put it on the product itself, like, you know, in the packaging, on the labeling, put it, you know, front and center that, you know, be aware this product is connected to the Internet in order to maximize your security from you know, third-party hacking or vulnerabilities to that, please be sure to update your software on a regular basis, all those types of things. But it's going to be complex because we know how humans are. Everybody behaves differently. Uh, in hindsight, people will change their stories. They'll say, if I had only had that warning, I wouldn't have, you know, bought the product. Or if I had known of this vulnerability, my actions would have been somewhat different because hindsight's always 20-20. So I think it's going to add another layer of complexity to what is already a complex area of human behavior uh, in the face of warnings of dangers with products. The, the complexity seems to get even more interesting in contexts like medical devices, for instance, where most of those products aren't marketed directly to the patient. So you've got a learned intermediary in there. Is the learned intermediary the doctor? Is it the IT staff at the hospital? So that, uh, that, that obviously creates some, some interesting situations there, too. Yeah, because now what you're doing is you're adding a layer of interaction between the device and the consumer or the patient and uh, a learned intermediary who is monitoring the activities with that. You know, counterfeiting is another issue with IoT because with, say, 3D manufacturing, it's being used to make artificial blood vessels. It's being made to you make hearing aids and so forth. And you, you're going to have issues about potential counterfeiting from that. You're going to have issues of um, the programming being messed around with and the device that's actually being made, made is not being made according to the original intended specifications, potentially. So there's, there's lots of things out there that, uh, from a security standpoint, um, is going to create a lot of concerns and issues. And some of these things will only get a lot of attention, unfortunately, once something bad happens. Okay, if you have questions, it's interactive at WLF.org. You, you had touched briefly upon the standards issue. Is that going to be an important aspect of the product liability uh, sort of scheme in terms of, of companies being able to say, 
we followed all the standards, we followed the standards that the government set or that the international sort of standard setting bodies set, is, is that going to have a role in, in the product liability scheme? It has to, and I mean it, it does now. It, the, the traditional uh, thing is we comply with all the standards. Generally, standards are considered minimum standards because that's what a standard is. It's a threshold that's met in order to meet a consensus agreement among industry and other interested stakeholders of government, perhaps, um, to say our product meets the minimal required uh, standards. Many companies, though, manufacture their products to exceed those standards, and that then becomes part of the product story when you're trying to defend the product, that you met or exceed the standard and that even within the standard, the components many times have their own standards that they have to comply with. So there's like a matrix or networks of interactive standards that apply. Right now, we don't have the standards for the IoT, and we don't have the IoT worked into the existing standards that govern the product safety of many products. That's all going to take some time. And meanwhile, we're taking off with these products, and so there's going to be a lag time so then it's going to be until these standards become kind of more common and recognized, I think we're going to see uh, companies are going to have to defend themselves by their own internal standards and how hard they work to ensure that the vulnerabilities are identified. And one of the things that the FTC, for instance, is saying and um, the uh, Inter Industrial Internet Consortium is that security has to be from the ground up and it has to be from cradle to grave. It, they even say it from, from the sand because they're talking about silicon chips. So they talk about it all the way till the end. It can't be an afterthought. It can't be we've got this wonderful product. Oh, somebody just told me this might be vulnerable to a hack. Now let's figure out how to, how to prevent that from happening. It's got to be built in from the beginning. In terms of, of uh, managing liability risk, do you think that there's a component here for public education and consumer education so people understand what these devices are. As I said at the outset, 87% of the people don't know what the Internet of Things is because it's such an amorphous sounding sort of concept, but um, how, how much of a role do you think public education is going to play in, in helping to avoid liability, either product liability or breach of warranty, other things going down the road? I think it's got to be part of it, and I think there are so many platforms now where information can get out to the public. We're no longer, like when I grew up, you know, uh, we had three networks, okay, and black and white TV, and the news programs were half an hour every day, and that was primary source of news. We have so many different platforms, and especially with the younger generations, they're so much more involved in so many different applications of technology that there's lots of opportunities for interested stakeholders, you know, various consumer uh, industry groups, various uh, manufacturing industry groups to collaborate together and find ways to get the information out there, not just through the product literature that comes with the product, but educate, public service messages, things like that, so that people are aware that, you know, there's great benefits to be derived from the Internet of Things, but at the same time, there's a level of risk that needs to be looked at objectively and candidly discussed and then work on ways to minimize those risks. I don't think we'll ever erase those risks or drive them out, but the idea is like there's got to be low-hanging fruit that can be taken right off the tree at the beginning in order to advance the goal of better security, better products. I, I haven't bought a new car recently, but I know from talking to some people who have that they are encouraged to go to classes to learn how to use certain aspects of their car, and, and some aspect of that has to be uh, you would think um, educating people to make sure that they don't get into situations where the, there's, there's defects or they fail to upgrade the software or those sort of things. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing. Now, I'm not aware of that, but I think that's probably a good idea. I'd be interested to see how many people actually take up that opportunity, uh, whether there is a cost associated with it or is it part of the basic purchase price of the vehicle. But then that becomes an important aspect of the automobile manufacturer's defense. We offered the training. We encouraged people to do it. We did it at no cost. And 25% of the people take it up. Well, you've captured an audience, at least, that you hope is better able to deal with the technological issues with the vehicle. But then you got the 75% that maybe not. And then somewhere along the line, somebody has a problem, and they say, well, the car behaved in a way that I didn't expect. You've got maybe a basis for part of a defense. 
This is something that we provided training on. It's in our instruction manual. Um, did you take advantage of it or not? Staying on the, the auto sort of context, a question from a viewer asks, um, the Copyright Office in the Library of Congress recently ruled that people should be able to tinker with the software that comes with their cars and not worry about being sued for copyright infringement. That certainly, you would think, creates some issues with the Internet of Things and, and, and liability as well. Could you, you address that briefly? Well, I'm not an IP or copyright lawyer, but what I would say as a product liability lawyer is that if somebody tinkers with the software, then it's sort of like they're changing the product. I mean, a, a simple thing happens is, is if, if um, a product is sold off the shelf in a box, the retailer generally can look to the distributor and the manufacturer to defend, indemnify it, because it has had done nothing but sell the product. So common law principles ultimately mean on strict liability, it should go up the chain of distribution. However, what happens is if the consumer takes the product home, operates it, maybe does a few things with it, repackages it, brings it back and says, I don't like it, I want my money back. It's a you know, buyer's remorse type of a return. That's fine, but if then the retailer turns around and resells the product, they may have violated the notion that they're an innocent seller. And so the same thing may apply, and I would think the arguments would be along the same lines. Once you modify the code, it's no longer the original condition as it was when it left the hands of the manufacturers. And if that manipulation in any way has impacted on the performance leading to the failure and the loss, then that may be a defense. Do you anticipate more suits similar to the ones that have been filed so far that are alleging for common law or, or state fraud um, claims than product liability claims? Do you see those sort of starting to emerge prior to product liability claims starting to sort of take hold, or how do you see that going? Yeah, I, I think that's the, the initial foray because uh, one of the reasons why you have product liability, no injury class actions is as soon as you start identifying within the class individuals who have had injuries, that creates a situation where the commonality doesn't exist anymore. Each particular individual's fact pattern leading to the loss may be different, their injuries may be different, so they're no longer kind of a homogenous type of a class of individuals. The product liability class action model also plays into a small glitch that may or may not manifest itself in real damages, but people will say, I wouldn't have bought the product if I had known that there were these vulnerabilities with that, and the product is worth less money today than what I paid for it because these vulnerabilities are now recognized. And so that will become the economic you know, value proposition, if you will, that allows these kinds of actions to go forward. And of course, if we're dealing with a product, it could be a small product, but if there's hundreds of thousands or millions of them, then we have the potential for a huge exposure um, uh, to the companies that are selling the products, and it's a fertile ground for the plaintiff's bar. I think that's probably a good place to end things here. Uh, hopefully we, we sufficiently, not necessarily scared people, but uh, <laughs> raised some awareness today about, about a lot of issues that are arising that, that I'm sure some people were not aware of. I uh, want to thank you, Michael, for, for joining us today, coming down from, from White Plains to, to do this live with us. This is going to be, this is, has been uh, recorded, so if you came in late or if you know somebody 